Good day, everyone. I'm David Wheeler, creator of PGXN and principal architect at Tembo. Today, I'd like to talk about the state of the Postgres extension ecosystem. It's past, it's present, and the future. Now, what I mean by the extension ecosystem is how one discovers extensions, learns about them, and installs them, and the challenges that have hindered broad adoption to date. So let's go back to the beginning. Postgres has a long history of extensibility. In the old days, there were two basic approaches to extending Postgres without forking it. One was uh, loading dynamic shared objects into the shared preload libraries configuration variable. And the other was pure SQL extensions and, and stored pr and procedural languages and SQL features that used procedural languages and SQL features to create objects. Now, there were quite a few intrepid ad early adopters in those years, including PostGIS, via Postgres, PLR, PLProxy, PGTap, and more. Then Dimitri Fontaine submitted a patch for a formal extension support, which was committed and released in Postgres 9.1 back in 2011. This work built on those existing patterns for extending Postgres, but formalized things through three key features. Tooling to compile and install extensions, both DSOs and pure SQL. New SQL commands to create, update, and drop extensions, which bundle together, bundle together objects into named units and backup and restore support to ensure consistent versioning and behavior when upgrading Postgres itself. The artifact that holds these pieces together is the control file named for the extension it manages. This file tells Postgres the default or latest released version of an extension, the path to any DSO modules and other configuration data, like whether the extension could be moved from one schema to another. The Postgres build system was also optimized for extensions. One need only create a make file with the extension name and for DSOs, the module directory, a list of documentation files and SQL files to deploy versions of the extension, as well as the paths of the DSOs to be built, and configuration for testing and the PG regress utility. Now the user who's building the extension can point to the PG config utility relevant for their Postgres version, and the make file simply loads the pgxs make configuration and runs it, taking advantage of all these variables to do the right thing. So this setup enables straightforward compilation of C and SQL extensions by running make. Then make install installs all the relevant files, including the control file, SQL files, and DSOs. And finally, make install check runs the pg regress tests against the newly installed extension. And now the user can use create extension to add the extension to a database. And thanks to the bundling features into a single unit, PG dump, out can like, PG dump output can likewise simply install the extension as before. So this new infrastructure created new opportunities for the extensibility of Postgres. I was pretty excited about the possibilities around that time, publicly claiming that PostgreSQL today is not merely a database, it's an application development plan. As a result, I propose to create PGXN, a service for distributing Postgres extensions, with the goal to be the canonical source for all publicly available extensions. The features were to include distribution of source code, as well as user registration and namespace management, so there would be no conflict between named extensions. PGXN also aimed to provide comprehensive search features and the ability to browse and read well-written documentation. Individual releases could also be tagged for better discoverability. A command line client, meanwhile, would provide simple, a simple interface to download, compile, and install, install extensions. Now, a number of features were out of scope of this vision. These included binary packaging. PGXN would be for source code distribution only. It seemed too much to take on support for a wide variety of platforms, so we deferred binary distribution to the community apt and yum repositories. PGXN also would not include developer tooling or build tooling. These were already solutions for building extensions, most notably PGXS and whatever future directions the core project might take to support extension authors. So I launched the project in 2010 Around the same time, Dimitri started developing formal extension support. And by December, the little fundraiser I'd set up had met its goal and it was time to get to work. The site pgxn.org 
launched in April of 2011 with the first few extensions in a public REST API. Meanwhile, Daniel Verrazzo took it upon himself to write the command line client. It was on my list, but he beat me to it, which was cool because he wrote it in Python, deftly demonstrating that any language could use the APIs and interfaces. And almost to prove the point, Dixon Guedes released a suite of dev utils written in Ruby in June 2011. The community involvement was really great. So here's what PGXN looks like today on pgxn.org. It currently hosts over 2,200 releases of almost 400 extensions amongst 430 users. It's pretty cool, I think, so you should check it out if you're interested in extensions at all. As I said, there's also a robust REST API documented in the GitHub Wiki for the PGXN API project. In this example of the docs, the distribution API allows a client to find the latest release of an extension or the latest version. Now, the client that Daniela wrote uses that API. Here, we ask it to install the Semver extension. It uses the API to find the latest stable version and a second to download the zip file. Then it uses the core provided PGXN pipeline to compile the extension and then to install the parts where Postgres wants to find it. That's it. Now, over time, we've recognized a number of shortcomings to PGXN. First and foremost, there's been a little work on it since 2012. Over the years, I've kept it running and tweaked a few things here and there. And a couple of years ago, for example, I finally made it look decent on mobile devices. Another problem is that PGXN has always suffered from significant search limitations. Namely, it is defaulted to searching extension documentation, but most of Jewish distributions don't provide documentation separate from a readme and a readme at best. Sadly, PGXN has also not become the source of record for Postgres extensions. It contains at most 40% of publicly available extensions. And furthermore, releases of those extensions have been uneven and many abandoned, in part because the release process was quite manual until I developed a GitHub test and release workflow a few years ago. In other words, I would say that in classic SDLC fashion, the PGXN POC shipped as an MVP and was neglected. I hope you enjoy acronyms. Meanwhile, things have not stood still in the rest of the Postgres e uh, extension ecosystem. Chief among the changes has been the emergence of Postgres as a service providers. These uh, services provide and curate extensions for their users. As of this spring, a uh, month or so ago, Azure provides 25 non-core extensions, GCP provides 29, AWS provides 48. PGXN, meanwhile, as I said before, has 369 distributions with 396, almost 400 extensions. But those are just a fraction of those available. Joel on SQL has inventoried almost 1,200 publicly available extensions in a wide variety of locations, especially on GitHub. So this leads me to wonder, why has uptake been so modest? Despite the best of the intentions, some opportunities were never met. Postgres extensions remain quite difficult to find and discover since they're scattered to the internet winds. Most that one can find, including on PGXN, are underdocumented and difficult to understand. I mean, you do find them, it can be tricky to gauge the maturity, reliability, and stability of an extension especially if there isn't much documentation. Furthermore, they're difficult to configure and install. Most users just want to add them to their dev or production clusters and not have to install a bunch of tooling like compilers and developer packages on those servers. Now, a lot of this has to do with there being no comprehensive binary packaging system covering a wide variety of platforms, architectures, and Postgres versions. It's catch as catch can between the community apt and yum repositories and tools like Homebrew, and Windows is pretty much omitted altogether. Now, clearly, the centralized distribution of source code has been insufficient to meet the needs of people who just want to quickly find, install, and use extensions. Part of the problem, I think, is insufficient developer tooling. One has to suss out how to create and maintain extensions by following scattered blogs and example repositories, and the lack of features like documentation standards increase the difficulty in providing consistent product. But as I said, things haven't stood still. 
A number of new projects have emerged in the last couple of years that attempted to fill some of the development and distribution gaps. One such development is Trusted Language Extensions, or TLEs. The TLE project wants to empower application developers to build database functionality without having to do the full compile install dance on their servers. By supporting only trusted languages, TLEs eliminate the need to install files on the server file system like C extensions require. Any trusted language works, including SQL, PLSQL, excuse me, PLPGSQL, PLPerl, PLV8, PLRust, and more. The PGTLE extension provides functions for easy installation, and TLEs can be ported between systems and architectures since there's, they require no compilation. Now, once an extension is installed, PGTLE has hooks into the create extension command to allow seamless loading of the extension. And the system supports custom data types via its API, which exposes the underlying Postgres APIs without requiring C access. This pattern will be used to add support for other hooks in the future, those not normally impossible uh, without C, including foreign data wrappers and background workers. The project also aims to inspire or at least inform designs for adding SQL-only extensions to the core. Our friends at AWS and Superbase steer this project. So here's a TLE example that installs an extension named pair. Note that the first few arguments to install extension function are pretty much identical to the contents of the control file that we saw earlier. We pass the contents of the normal SQL files that create the extension objects as subsequent arguments. And then once installed, thanks to PGTLE's hooks into the guts of Postgres, a normal create extension command will automatically load the extension, just as if it had been installed via the file system as we saw earlier. Another recent source of excitement is PGRX, a framework for building extensions in Rust. It's like C in that it builds shared object libraries to be loaded into Postgres, but provides fairly transparent bridges from the Postgres C APIs to, C to Rust. This allows full access to nearly all Postgres features, including custom data types, functions, triggers, foreign data wrappers, background wor uh, workers, and more. And since PGRX is just Rust, it's easy to quickly add functionality from Rust crates without having to write something from scratch. PGRX also provides developer-friendly tooling to manage test clusters, run tests, install packages, uh, install and package the extension, and more, as well as automatic schema generation, simplifying the management of the SQL used to create an extension. There's a ton of community excitement and a slew of Rust extensions released every month. The project itself is under active development, thanks to our friends at ZomboDB and the PG Central Foundation. So let's take a look at this, an example here. I recently created a PGRX project to do JSON schema validation, uh, add JSON schema validating functions. Uh, this uses the boon crate from crates.io to do full JSON schema version 2020 found validation. These functions define the Postgres interface. Now note the type of the function signature. The JSON type here transparently maps JSON, uh, Postgres JSON to Rust Serde objects. And a second function does the same for JSON B. All the core types have corresponding PGRX types, including arrays, ranges, and variadic arguments to functions. The pgxturn macro tells PGRX how to define the SQL function. Here it's named JSON schema validates, which differs from its Rust name, as you can see. An identical macro for the JSON B version uses the same name, mapping the Rust functions to polymorphic J Postgres functions. The resulting SQL looks like this. Note the JSON B arguments. The same goes for the JSON B version. Using the same function name, PGRX automatically generates this SQL code from the, source, the Rust source code. Meanwhile, a number of projects have cropped up to try to improve upon the PGXN discovery and installation issues. Database.dev, or dbdev, is a new packaging registry for trusted language extensions. The service makes it super easy to download and install TLEs right from in the database. Tembo, meanwhile, developed Trunk, hosted at pgt.dev, which provides binary packaging for over 200 extensions. 
Today, it supports only AMD 64 Linux, but plans to support a wide variety of platforms and OSs in the future. Similarly, PGXMan from Hydra provides Debian packages for many extensions and plans to support Mac OS packages. And these binary registries have all emphasized features that PGXMan have not. These include ease of use, as in this demonstration of installing PGXMan and a first extension in just two commands. Platform neutrality, as in trunk showing the available platforms for an extension. Statistics, such as dbdev listing download numbers for an extension, which can be helpful for evaluating maturity and community acceptance. And curation, as in trunk's use of categories for extensions, which have proven a popular vector for discovering extensions to address particular issues in specific problem domains. Now, all these recent developments have invigorated the broader extension ecosystem, but many of the promises we saw early on, sadly, have yet to be fulfilled. To it, there is no single source for a complete list of all extensions or a single registry of all extensions. Every attempt at doing so remains incomplete. <clears throat> this makes discovery difficult as one has to know to search PGXN, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, the Postgres Wiki, various cloud providers, specific websites like PG, postgis.org, uh, some of those other binary registries and more just to find what they're looking for. And installation is difficult outside of the packages provided by your chosen installer, if you can find a list of them. No one wants to compile extensions in the production database server. And most extensions that do exist have very little documentation, usually just a readme. And the lack of documentation standard means that docs, when they exist, vary tremendously in quality and format. And all this has led to some pretty low adoption rates. Few databases use extensions at all, and the number uh, using more than one is vanishingly small. Still, as we've seen, there sure has been a lot of excitement around extensions lately. Which brings us to the future. What new opportunities are there to improve the extension ecosystem for developers and for users? To answer those questions, we've launched a project codenamed PGXN V2 to find out and make it happen. Now this came about thanks to Tembo, the creators of Trunk, who hired me specifically to consider emerging patterns like binary registries and development frameworks, to meditate on the deficiencies, including discovery and ease of installation, to engage deeply with the broader community of Postgres developers, extension authors, and users, in order to understand the use cases well enough to design and implement a new architecture that will serve uh, the community for the next decade or more. And one of the key points of community engagement has been the Extension Ecosystem Summit. We had six virtual mini summits to share ideas, discover patterns, discuss issues, as well as an in-person summit at pgconf.dev on May 28th. And the summit took place after the recording of this talk, so ask me how it went on the Discord. We've also worked to identify the key jobs to be done for the PGXN Extension Ecosystem. To wit, the jo one job is that it must be authoritative to be the official canonical source of record for all Postgres extensions. It has to be beneficial in that it's expected that extension authors, authors will benefit from developing and publishing their extensions there. It needs to be integrated so it's easier for developers to start writing and publishing their extensions. It of course has to be discoverable to make extensions easy to find and understand and informative to make extension documentation consistent, standardized, and comprehensive. Another job is for the uh, services in the ecosystem to be programmable, where distribution services provide stable, easy to use and comprehensive APIs with which downstream developers can build other tools and products that we can't even imagine. It needs, another job is to be installable to provide automatic binary packaging for a wide variety of platforms for as many of the extensions indexed by the service as possible. And furthermore, it needs to be trusted. To build, we need to build in some validation of extensions to protect from supply chain vulnerabilities. And finally, another job is for it to be manageable, to provide intuitive, powerful interfaces for installing and managing extensions. So I've made a high level architectural sketch to capture some of the categories and tools of service, the categories of tools and services to fulfill these jobs. Let's take a look. 
At root, of course, is the root registry, where authors register accounts and release extension source code. This is complemented by a well-known website for users to find those extensions, read docs, look at curation information, and download them. Next is the command line client, which allows one to quickly find, download, compile, and install any of the indexed extensions. Now, these three bits are uh, inspired by PGXN and other presidents. But brand new is the idea of interactions. These services stream changes like new releases, which subscribers can use for their own purposes. It will also provide write APIs where trusted clients can submit reports, badges, stats, and other metadata about extensions. Think test matrices or security scores. Stats and reports are the categories of services that provide this kind of data, getting notifications from interactions for recent releases, downloading sources from the root registry, and submitting results to their analysis to the interaction service, which then publishes them uh, in the root registry. From there, the web UX can pick them up and show the links and badges and simple stats to help users to evaluate extension quality and availability. And last but not least, we have the binary packaging services that support a wide variety of operating systems, architectures, and Postgres versions. They subscribe to the interactions to learn about new releases, pull source code from the root registry, and then use the client to build and package them, then push the packages back to the root registry so the appropriate availability data can be visible in the UX. The CLI then can install from the registry, eliminating the need for DBAs to compile from source on their production server. So that's the overall high-level architectural vision. Let's imagine now what it would look like. Here's a mock-up that imagines using the CLI to manage extensions. First, let's see what Postgres installs we, man we can manage. This host has four installs, one from Homebrew, two from PG PGENV, and the Postgres app. The manage list command also shows the root directory for its installation, like this one for the PGENV installed Postgres 16.3. So let's tell the CLI to manage that install. Now use the package list command to show the extension packages that the CLI manages for that install. Here we see there are three extensions from the Postgres core, plus the Semver package from PGXN user theory. Note the latest version listed here. That means there is a newer version available to be installed from the ecosystem. So let's use the upgrade command to upgrade it. Note that it found a binary package for Postgres 16, macOS Darwin, and the ARM64 architecture. It then installs the DSO in the libdir for that Postgres install. There's no compilation. The remaining SQL, control, and documentation files also go where they belong, and that's it. We plan to support at least Linux, BSD, and Windows, and likely others in the future. Now, let's say we want to do some JSON validation. We search the registry for JSON to see what's what. It shows the search results, including some stats. In this mock-up, there are some averages of some sort of rating service. This one looks decent. It has four stars, does the JSON schema validation, and it has a pretty recent release. So let's install it. As before, the CLI finds the binary package appropriate for the system of Postgres version, once again, just installing the pre-compiled DSO, as well as the control, SQL, and documentation files. So what does the list of packages look like now? There we go. Note that Semver and JSON schema are now the latest versions. Now, a crucial idea is that all of this is driven by RESTful APIs. So the functionality isn't limited to the CLI. Anyone could use it. For example, a Postgres as a service provider, like Tembo, will integrate the API to enable easy installation of binaries into their clusters from a web UX. So perhaps we use that UI to search for Semver among all the PGXN extensions. And then, having found it, click the Install button and get the extension. This functionality is identical to the CLI installation example and uses all the APIs. All public and private Postgres services will be able to use a service or to federate or curate extensions for their customers. So that's the vision. We'd love to have you join the effort. Feedback and ideas in particular are greatly appreciated. And the homepage for the project is on the Postgres wiki, as is a document that goes into much more detail on the proposed high-level architecture. The project to build all this is managed in a PJXN GitHub project. 
as are the tasks to be carried out for each service, tool, and feature. And I've also blogged extensively about the project and questions and things I'm thinking through since the beginning of the year at my blog, justatheory.com. And the best place to stay in the loop and to get involved is in the extensions channel on the community Slack. And you can join it here at pgtreats.info slack slash slack invite. So that's it for the uh, state of the Postgres extension ecosystem. Thank you for uh, tuning in and I hope to chat with you soon.